Well, welcome friends and church family. Um, it's good to be back together as we continue to study the Gospel of Matthew together. We're in the 10th week of our study of Matthew. I uh, hope you've been enjoying it so far. Um, last week we had probably the hardest week to cover, uh, over three chapters of narrative that we looked at last week, um, chapters um, uh, 16, 17, 15, 16, and 17. And um, this week, thankfully, we only have one little chapter, 35 verses to cover. Um, so um, hopefully we can go a little slower and, and really dive in. Um, so this is the fourth discourse out of five discourses in Matthew. If you've been with us for the full study, we talked about how Matthew's gospel is different from the other gospels in its message, um, that Jesus, presenting Jesus as the Messiah, the King uh, that God promised. Um, but also it's different in its structure, and that structure of Matthew is built around five discourses, um, the first one being the Sermon on the Mount, and then we've seen uh, two others uh, after that, and this today is we're in our fourth discourse. So let me remind you what we covered last week. Last week we saw um, a stretch of narratives that the emphasis of each story was really uh, as Jesus is starting to head more intentionally to the cross. So he begins to speak plainly to the disciples that that's what he came to do, to go to the cross. And really every story last week was showing the glory of Jesus um, as he heads to the cross. The glory is going to be most fully displayed in the cross, but also the shadow of the cross is looming over Jesus's ministry right now. And the disciples and all the crowds, the Pharisees, all of them um, are refusing to listen to Jesus as he heads to the cross. So that's what we saw last week is, uh, is profound misunderstanding from the disciples. Peter makes the great confession by the Spirit of God um, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, it's upon that confession, upon that rock, that I will build my church. So it's a high moment for Peter. But then right after that, Jesus says, this is what the Messiah came to do. He came to um, to be crucified and die and on the third day be raised. And Peter says, absolutely not, um, tries to rebuke Jesus. And so that's what we're going to see. The disciples are just completely not listening to Jesus as he's describing what the Messiah came to do. So that shadow of the cross loomed over all of that narrative. And so now we come to another discourse. And what this section is, is Jesus describing what life in the kingdom is really going to be like. So the disciples begin to ask him questions about the kingdom, about what life will be like. The first question they ask is, "Who? how are you going to decide who the greatest is in the kingdom? Uh, a terrible question. <laughs> but but yeah, that's what they want to know, what the disciples want to know. How, how are you going to determine who's the greatest? And, um, and from that uh, discussion on through this whole chapter, chapter 18, Jesus begins to explain the unexpected nature of, of what life looks like as a part of the kingdom of God. Now, he's not talking predominantly about, um, uh, you know, heaven, but he is. He's talking about uh, the future kingdom of God in the new heavens and the new earth. But he's also talking about life as those who belong to his kingdom in this broken and fallen world as we live. So that's what this chapter is about. It's mainly Jesus speaking, and he is describing what life is like in the kingdom of heaven. So let me pray for us and we will dive right in. Father, we thank you for, um, yeah, just an opportunity to study your word together today. Pray for everyone on this call that you would speak to them personally about what you want to say to them about how they're living life as your disciples. Um, Father, these teachings were not just for the apostles. They are for all of us that seek to live as those who belong to the kingdom of God. So speak to us today as we turn to your word and uh, help us to see clearly um, how our lives can be informed now um, and how our hopes can be informed later as to what it is to be a part of the kingdom of God. Thank you for um, this technology and how we get to study together every week uh, through this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, so um, we're going to start at, with 18 verse 1, and today we're covering just the chapter 18. So I'm going to go a little slower than I usually am, but since we're not um, covering as much material so and do more reading. 
So let me begin by just reading that first section, 18, 1 um, through, uh, well, actually, we'll just start with 1 through 4. So it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a little child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Um, and then we're going to go on in that section. But, but uh, the disciples come and ask him, um, how is greatness going to be determined in the kingdom of heaven? Who's going to be um, of higher stature? Right Now, this is a question that reveals um, their own hearts, that they are, are being competitive with each other, wanting to know who of them is going to be the greatest. But Jesus um, takes this as an opportunity to say two things. And, and first, it's reminding them, uh, and this comes from the Beatitudes, of how they come to the kingdom, right? So you, you see that. He took this child, put him in the midst, and he says, um, unless you uh, become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, and then he goes on to say um, the way in which we need to become like children. So Jesus isn't calling us to be immature or childlike in the way that we behave. Instead, he's saying we humble ourselves like a child. So this this goes back to uh, remember, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the description of the character of those who belong to the kingdom began with humility, began with spiritual poverty, that we recognize that we have nothing to offer God, and so we humble ourselves before God, and that's the starting point. That's how we begin in the kingdom, is by humbling ourselves before the before God and, and asking him for mercy. Um. So he, he basically says, if you want to seek greatness in the kingdom, you seek it in the same way you began in the kingdom. You seek greatness in the same way that you began through humility. So greatness in the kingdom of heaven comes through humility. Um, so he'd already taught that. And he says the way you began, which is in spiritual poverty, is the way you will achieve greatness. Now, how do we know if we are living our spiritual life in humility. Well, I think that's what the next two sections are about that are all part of this emphasis on greatness through humility. Next, he says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. So one of the ways that we can understand if we're walking in humility is our humility will be seen in our care for the least significant in the kingdom. Uh, I'll say that again. Our humility can be seen in our care for the least significant. If we receive them and are serving them and caring for them, um, then uh, that's taking a humble position. But instead, if we're, doing, if we're taking advantage of them or using them or in some way leading them in, to sin, now what does he mean by leading them to sin? Well, it could mean leading them into temptation, but it could also mean just um, condescending to them or not caring for them. So you create bitterness in their heart towards those who belong to the kingdom. So he says the, the way you relate to the least significant. So I say least significant because he's using a child as an example and of course, in this society, children had no social standing whatsoever. So to do for a child could, could help you none, especially as an adult male, right? To, um, to do something kind for a child was just an act of complete hum humble uh, service. It wasn't anything that could exalt you. And so he says, you want to see if you're walking in humility? Look at how you're treating the least of these. Are you making sacrifices in order to receive them, to serve them? Or are you leading them into sin, right? Are you modeling for them um, pride and egotism and things like that? Now, remember some of the times the disciples had children come up to them and they said, don't bother him, right? Don't bother him. Um, uh, that was an example, right, of, of their pride actually causing those children to sin, to turn away from Jesus or, or to not uh, come to him. And he says, don't do that. Don't do that. Welcome them to come to me. Um, so children are symbolic here of, of the least significant in the kingdom of God. Now, it is talking about 
Christians because it says, whoever causes one of any of these little ones who believe in me to sin. So it's talking within the kingdom of God. Um, are you, if, if, if you're walking in humility, then you are caring for and caring about the least significant in the community. You are caring for and caring about the least significant community. That's one way you can see your humility on display. So Jesus says, when you get to heaven and you're looking for who the great ones are, it's the ones that did that, right? Who cared about and cared for those least significant in the kingdom. Okay, but then there's another way he says you want to see your humility, uh, or, or you, can, you can look at your life and see humility. He, uh, he goes on to say, Woe to the world for temptations to sin. It is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. So this is a, a bridge between what he just said, right? Um, it's terrible to lead somebody in a sin. He's saying it's terrible uh, for that person who temptation comes. But then he goes on to say, If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet and be thrown in the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, he's speaking hyperbolically, right? That's when you exaggerate for effect. Now, we know it's a hyperbole because your hand or your eye, the physical thing of my hand or my eye, can't make me sin, right? They don't have a will. They don't lead me into sin. I don't, you know, my hand doesn't lead me around the room or cause me to do anything. It's what's in my heart and in my mind that that causes my hand to do what it does and my eye to do what it was. So Jesus isn't speaking literally here that we should cut out our eyes or cut off our hands, but he is giving you this example to say humility, spiritual poverty, right? Those who seek to be great in the, uh, in the kingdom of God means a radical assault against sin. Those people who will be great in the kingdom of God radically assault sin in their life. They make sacrifices. They cut things out of their life in order to put to death the sin that is in them. So in addition to caring about and caring for the least of these, we also, an expression of our humility that we realize there's nothing good that's in me, is we are radical in our fight against sin. Those who are great in the kingdom of God have the humility to make radical sacrifices in life to avoid falling into a lifestyle of sin. So Jesus is giving a vision that life in the kingdom means service for the least significant, and it means radically putting to death sin in your life, even if it means big sacrifices to uh, cut those things out of your life. So the question we have to ask if we want to be great in heaven, in other words, if we want um, to be exalted in heaven and hear, hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant, how are you treating the least significant in your community of faith in, in the kingdom of heaven, which is your gathered church? Do you make time for, do you care for, do you care about the needs of the least significant in the community of faith that you belong to? And then the second is, is are you radically attacking sin in your life? Being humble and saying, you know what? There's nothing good in me. There's nothing that commends me to God. I need to attack sin and ruthlessly attack it in my life. Not, not on my own strength, right? But through wisdom, right? Through eliminating sources of temptation in my life and through abiding in the Holy Spirit and letting God's word dwell in me richly so that I desire other things more than I desire the things of God, more than I desire the things of sin. So that is greatness in the kingdom of heaven. It's somebody who takes sin very seriously and it's somebody that cares for and cares about um, the, the least significant in the kingdom. Okay, so the kingdom greatness is, is through humility. The next section talks about kingdom joy. So what does heaven rejoice about? And therefore, what should we rejoice about? And the answer is um, the, the, the kingdom rejoices over repentant sinners, right? The kingdom rejoices over other people coming in. Now, why is this relevant to um, that first question that he asks? What must, you know, what is greatness? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, you can see the disciples are looking for joy in their own personal advancement, right? 
In other words, they're seeking joy of Jesus saying to them, well, you're going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, right? You are, because you 12 followed me. And so they understand joy as joy comes through personal advance. And the, uh, Jesus is saying, no, 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 the joy of the kingdom of heaven is over kingdom expansion, not personal advancement, right? And you see this in the disciples. They struggle um, with competitiveness with each other, with competitiveness towards outsiders. You remember we've seen in the other gospels stories about um, people uh, trying to cast out demons in Jesus' name. And he's like, hey, they're not part of our group. And Jesus is like, hey, if they're not against us, then they're for us, right? Um, so you should want the kingdom to expand to include others, others, repentant sinners. And so the way he tells that is, um, is by telling the parable of the lost sheep. Now, we saw this uh, parable, a version of it, in the Gospel of Luke. But in that instance, he was using it to, um, to say to the Pharisees, hey, don't uh, begrudge the fact that I meet with sinners because to find a lost thing is a joyful thing. So the joy theme is still here, but now he's more holistically saying, um, your life should be marked by seeking the joy of kingdom expansion, of seeing repentant sinners come into heaven. So here's what he says. See to it that you do not despise one of these little ones. So that's, again, connecting with the humility subject before, uh, serving the, the least significant. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, this is a difficult verse to translate. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my fathers in heaven. Um, does this Is this teaching guardian angels for every person in the kingdom of God? Um, I don't think so. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's possible with the language. But the reason I don't think so is, uh, number one, um, there's no other scripture that says that there's an angel assigned to each person. Um, so if, if so, this would be teaching something brand new. Um, and then also this word that's used here in Greek for angels can mean angel, but it can also mean spirit. Um, you may remember in Acts when, um, when Paul escapes from prison and he shows up at the house, uh, sorry, Peter escapes from prison and he shows up at the house where they're praying for him in prison and the, the little girl who answers says, hey, Peter's at the door. They think it's a ghost, right? They think it's Peter's spirit because they know Peter's body is in prison. So they can't fathom that he is out of prison. And so they think it's his spirit. And the same word is used there in Acts for this word. So I think what this is saying is um, don't despise these little ones because their spirits well, just like you, one day are destined for eternal glory to to um, uh, to be in an exalted state in the presence of God for eternity. Um, so, I think what he's saying here is the reason you should care for the least significant is because they are destined for eternal glory. They are important to God. Um, God has set His favor on them. And so don't judge them by the outside. Judge them by the fact that their spirits are already united with God and will be with him for all eternity uh, in his presence. Um, and then he goes on to tell the parable of the lost sheep, which we know. If a man has a hundred sheep and one goes astray, doesn't he leave the ninety-nine to go and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the, than if it, the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven um, that one of these little ones should perish. So in, in using this parable, he talks about the joy in heaven over anyone that comes into the kingdom of God, any one sinner that is found. He says there's more joy in that moment for one more redeemed than already having 99 that are in the fold, right? There's, there's so much joy there. Now, how does this affect us? What is Jesus saying to his disciples about their life as those who seek to belong to the kingdom? He's saying, don't take joy in your own exaltation, right? Don't take joy in your own exaltation. Don't seek to exalt yourself. Take joy in every one of these little ones that has been brought into a destiny of eternal glory to be with God forever. 
That's where your joy should be. Your joy should be in spending your life to find these little ones secure in eternity. Now, little ones doesn't mean children, right? It means the least of these. It means anyone that, that the world considers insignificant is not insignificant if you can bring them the message of Jesus because they can be uh, uh, destined for eternal glory in the presence of God. And that's what heaven rejoices about. So that's what we should be about. That's where our joy should be. Okay, so kingdom greatness comes through humility. Kingdom joy comes by repentant sinners. So we need to be about others, not about ourselves. Now the next section um, is kingdom unity comes through accountability. So you may remember the parable of the weeds from the third discourse. If you remember, that's a parable that's unique to Matthew. And he says, the kingdom of God is like a farmer that goes out and sows its wheat. And somebody at night sows a bunch of weeds with it and they grow up together. And the point of that parable was that God is going to build his kingdom in the midst of a weedy world, right? And weedy world means a fallen and sinful world. So um, in light of that parable, right, that the kingdom of God is going to be built in the midst of a sinful world, um, how is the kingdom going to maintain uh, its integrity, right, Dear, uh, its unity? How is the kingdom going to do that in the midst of such a broken world? And that's what this section is about. He says, um, this is beginning in verse 15, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now, you probably know that last verse, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Um, but you may not remember that that verse is in the context of church discipline, right, of, of uh, helping people in sin, helping people in sin. So the first thing we see in that first section there is that um, uh, the earthly manifestation of the kingdom of God, which is the church, right, the church, it will be maintained through accountability, through accountability. Now, what does that mean? It means that we are called as those who belong to the kingdom to help others who belong to the kingdom in the midst of their sin. We're called to help them. Now, in this particular instance, uh, it's talking about a personal sin, right? One Christian uh, or one person that belonged to the kingdom uh, did something uh, negative against another Christian. But later in the New Testament, we see this same process should be used with regards to all sin. So whether that's a sin against you or whether there's somebody who's... Um, uh, you know, in bondage to any kind of sin, right? Um, they're, um, they're wasting their wealth. They're, they're bondage to greed and bondage to lust. They've left their spouse. Um, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Any sin that they're walking in, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is going to be maintained in the midst, midst of this weedy world by all of us holding each other accountable. Um, helping each other in the midst of the sin. So this is the internal threat, okay, to the kingdom of God. So in the, wits, in the fact that God is building his kingdom in a world where there's still temptation to sin, there's still all kinds of weeds in this fallen world, we are internally tempted to live like the world, even though we belong to the kingdom of God. And so the call is help each other help each other. Now, how do we help each other with sin? Well, when we see sin in somebody's life, we come to them as a brother or sister. If there's somebody who uh, claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then we come to them as a brother and sister, and we um, seek to restore them. We point out their sin, right? We say, hey, 
you're acting in disobedience to God or you sinned against me, right, um, in whatever way, we point out their sin and give them an opportunity to repent. Give them an opportunity to ask forgiveness of God and to be reconciled to us if that's needed. Um, now, if they don't listen to us, right, and, and there's lots of reasons they could not listen to us. Maybe they disagree that that wasn't sin. Maybe they think I'm wrong. Then we're told, bring uh, some other Christians with you. Um, bring a, another brother or sister with you and talk with them again and say, hey, we agree. My brother and sister, uh, uh, the brothers that I brought with me, agree uh, that this is a problem in your life. This is a sin thing and you need to repent of it. Um, you need to turn and be faithful. And uh, now why would, why would God have us do that? Um, well, because our moral judgment is imperfect, right? So we might not, we may think somebody's in the wrong and, and some, a brother or sister can help us see, um, actually, I don't think that they're in sin. And so bringing in other people um, does two things. It adds, it protects this person against um, our imperfect moral judgment um, and establishes agreement that there's a need for repentance. Um, and then the second thing it does is it makes it brings greater and greater accountability and consequences um, because now multiple people right are involved um, and that's that's hopefully going to be an impetus to help them repent and then the third thing he says to do if they don't listen to you and they don't listen to you and some brothers that you brought with you brothers and sisters you brought with you then bring it before the whole church now this is talking about a local church right Bring the issue before the church and say, hey, you know, this person sinned against me or this person is in sin, living in sin. And they refuse to repent and turn from that and let the whole church call them to account and say, hey, we love you. Um, we want you to be reconciled to God. This is a this is in a disobedience to God. You've done the wrong thing. You need to repent. You need to repent. If they still refuse to repent. What does the scriptures tell us to do? Treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, what do those words mean? Basically, it means treat them as somebody who is not a part of the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean we don't love them. It, it, it exact opposite is true. It means that we continue to love them and plead with them to trust in Christ and repent, turn from their sin and trust in Christ. That's what we do to any unbeliever. We, we love them, right? We love uh, our enemies. We love everybody. We love them intentionally, and we call them to turn away from sin and repent. But we no longer consider them a part of the kingdom and a part of that local church fellowship. Um, now, that's a hard thing to do, right? That's a very hard thing to do. First, it's hard to confront people about sin. And then secondly, it's hard to go through this process and actually get to a point where you say, hey, you know what? You continue to be unrepentant. So our church doesn't see any reason to believe that you are walking in faithfulness to God. So um, the first goal of this process is to help brothers and sisters in a fallen, weedy world, right, deal with their own internal struggles to obey Jesus, right, their own tendencies towards sin. But that second stage where we actually say, okay, you continue to be unrepentant, now um, we're no longer allowing you to be a part of this church, removing them from the church um, as those who are not of the kingdom actually protects the church from being a blend, right, of wheat and weeds. And if that were to happen and we don't deal with that, in other words, there are a lot of people in the church who are not living for Jesus and are walking in unrepentant sin, um, then the church loses its witness in the world. And so Jesus, knowing how sober of a task this is to call somebody to accountability for sin and to know how, how personally difficult this would be to say to somebody, hey, you're continuing to be unrepentant. Therefore, we're removing you from the church and we plead with you to turn away from your sin and trust in Christ um, because we no longer see any evidence that he is Lord of your life. For anybody to say that is so sober. So what Jesus says is, I'm going to give you two reasons that you can be confident in doing that. Number one, um, and he quotes the same verse that we saw uh, last week, 
Um, as the church, whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth should be loosed in heaven. Basically, he's saying when you do that, what you're doing is reflecting on earth what is true in heaven. Those who are truly a part of the kingdom of God in heaven walk in repentance and faith. And so when someone refuses to walk in repentance and faith in Christ, and you say, therefore, you're not a member of the church, you are acting on heaven's authority, right? To reflect on earth what is true in heaven. And the second thing he says is, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done by the Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. Now, oftentimes that text is taken out of context and it's used to apply to any time. Two or three people are gathered in the name of Jesus that God will answer their prayer and be in the midst of them. And, and though there is some truth to that, right? When Christians gather, he's in the midst. That's not what this text is really about. This text is another um, ground for why we can do this hard work. And that is that um, whenever we go through this process and not just act based on what we think or not just act back on what me and my friend think, but we go through this process and the church is in agreement that this person is not walking in faith and repentance with God. He said, you can be comforted by, you're reflecting the authority of heaven, but then secondly, you can be comforted that Jesus himself, his presence is in the midst of you. And the things that you are doing um, are things that he approves. Um, so, so we have the presence of God and we have the authority of heaven that says when we do this hard work to hold people accountable to walk in repentance of faith, um, we are actually preserving the unity of the kingdom. Um, so that's something that also is supposed to mark our church, that we're supposed to help each other when we fall into sin, and we're supposed to hold each other accountable. And if there's somebody who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ and is, is not willing to repent and walk in faithfulness to him, then we do the hard thing of saying, well, brother, sister, I don't think you're following Jesus Christ. And I think you need to repent and turn to him and be saved. And you can't be a member of this church. Now that's a sober responsibility, but we do it with the authority of God. Okay, uh, the last section is the longest of this story, and that's because Jesus tells a, uh, a pretty long parable as part of this section. And the emphasis of this section is that um, life in the kingdom is marked by mercy that flows from God's grace. Life in the kingdom is marked by mercy that flows from God's grace. So it begins with um, another question. Peter comes up and asks Jesus, Lord, how often will my, uh, will my brother sin against me and I must forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times but I say 77 times, 77 times. Now, um, that first section there is basically Jesus saying, there's no limit to the amount of forgiveness that those who belong to the kingdom extend to somebody else. So the tradition, and Peter almost certainly knew this, the tradition, the Jewish tradition uh, taught that um, if somebody sinned against you, you had to forgive them uh, up to three times, right? Up to three times. But beyond that, it's almost like a three strikes and you're out thing, right? After three times, you didn't have to just continue to forgive them. Um, uh, but, you know, you could break ties with them and say, hey, I no longer forgive you. And, and he had no obligation towards them. Um, so, so Peter seems to be trying to be um, you know, very bold and magnanimous, right? And by saying, should I forgive my brother up to seven times, right? Over double uh, the, what the tradition taught. And of course, Jesus's response is 77, which isn't an exact number, right? It's basically saying more than you can count. You keep forgiving your brother more than you can ever count. So the kingdom of God is marked by those who extend limitless forgiveness, limitless forgiveness. We are always ready to forgive those who have sinned against us. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean um, you can always keep active fellowship with the person, okay? Why? Because if you forgive them, but they aren't willing to forgive you, or they are not sorry for what they did, or they still want to harm you, well, you might not be able to maintain fellowship, but still you can extend forgiveness to them, you can want the best for them, you can pray for them, you can fully, from as far as it depends on you, 
um, uh, forget that, uh, forgive that sin. So forgiveness doesn't always mean fellowship, but it always means that we um, uh, we no longer hold that sin against them. Um, so we, why do we extend limitless forgiveness? And and the basis for that, um, Jesus defends by giving a parable. So he tells a parable. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole parable, but he says, um, the kingdom of heaven could be compared to a king who settled his debts with his servants. And he has one servant out of his servants that owes him uh, what the scripture says is 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. Now, a talent was approximately 20 pounds of gold. 20 pounds, okay? If you follow the price of gold, the price of gold now is, I don't know, like $2,000 an ounce, right? Does that mean a pound of gold is like $64,000 or something? No, no, 32,000, yeah, $32,000. So imagine 20 pounds is one talent, right? So that's $600,000. And he says he owed him 10,000 talents, 10,000 times, that's $64 million, I think. Is that right? Something like that. Crazy. Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. He owes him an insurmountable, almost an unimaginable amount of money to the king. Who knows how he, on earth anybody could have a debt like that. But he owes him tens of millions of dollars. This At this time, this would have been an amount of money that you couldn't even imagine, right? It had been like trying to imagine the golden Fort Knox. So Jesus says that's how, what kind of debt he has to the king. And he goes in and he pleads for mercy. He pleads for mercy so that the king wouldn't put him to death. And not only does the king not put him to death, not only that, but he f completely forgives the debt. He says, you don't have to pay me back anything. Not only will I not put you to death as somebody who can't repay me, but you uh, are completely forgiven of that 10,000 talent debt. So this servant leaves the king's presence he goes out and he finds a fellow servant, right, who owes him 100 denarii. Now, denarii was a day's wage, a typical day's wage for a common worker. So it's 100 days wages. That's like three months salary, right, for a common person. So maybe a few thousand dollars. So that's not a tiny amount of money, but compared to the tens of millions of dollars, that was for, this is an ins insignificant amount of money, right? Completely insignificant in, in light of what he owed the king. And what does this man do when he finds this servant? He seizes him and begins to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. His fellow servant pleads with him, "I have patience with me. I will try to pay you. Um, but he refuses to have patience with him and has him thrown into debtor's prison. Uh, the parable goes on to say, the king hears about this and throws him uh, into, uh, um, what does he say? He says, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and you didn't have mercy on your fellow servant. He says, he delivers him to the jailers until he pays the fullness of the debt. Well, of course, he's never going to repay that. So permanently imprisoned. So what's the lesson of this parable? Well, it's pretty simple. We forgive limitlessly because of the limitless grace that has been extended to us in Jesus, okay? Our mercy is insignificant, but it's just an overflow of all that God has done for us. Um, God's, grace, God's grace to us in forgiving our sin at the cost of his son is unimaginably larger than any amount of forgiveness we will ever be asked to extend to others. So we extend limitless forgiveness to others because we have been transformed by the limitless grace that has been lavished on us by our King, okay? So the reason Jesus can say, no, Peter, not seven times, 77 times, or I think the King James says seven times 70, right? Um, it doesn't matter. A limitless number, a number you cannot even keep track of. That's how many times you can forgive. The basis for that is, don't you see how much God has done to forgive you? Shouldn't that have transformed you to be a person who wants to forgive instead of wants to set limits on forgiveness? 
So ask yourself that question. Do you have any grudges in your life? Do you have people that you're just like, I don't have any time for them. They burn that bridge. I remember in my life one time, I stumbled across a friend that I had in high school on Facebook, right? And this guy was not kind to me growing up. Um, I won't get into the details, but he was just not a good person to me. And I found myself looking at pictures of him and his family and kind of wanting him to turn out badly. I remember seeing him in a picture of his wife. I'm like, what could she see in that guy, right? And I could just sense there's still bitterness in my heart from this guy who did things to me 20 years ago, right? And so just right then I was like, God, you have forgiven me of so much more, so much more than I could ever know or imagine. Help me to forgive this guy for the small ways uh, in which he was unkind to me. So we extend limitless forgiveness. So if you have people in your life that you've written off or that you've unforgiven, maybe in your own family, remember that our forgiveness is an expression, an overflow of the grace that's been given to us. Okay, so let's sum up. Life as part of the kingdom of heaven was not at all what the disciples were expecting. Greatness comes through humility. Joy is found in kingdom expansion not personal advance. Each person should be seeking the help of others and helping others to guard against sin because we grow up, the kingdom of God is being built in this weedy world, and we have to preserve the church as a reflection of the kingdom of heaven by removing anyone who is not walking in repentance and faith. And then finally, we practice limitless forgiveness and love towards every person because we have been forever changed by the limitless grace that God has shown towards us. Thanks, friends. Uh, I look forward to continuing our study next week, and I hope this is a blessing to you and that you'll spend some time reflecting on, is this the way my life looks as one who belongs to the kingdom of heaven? Father, thank you for this time together. I pray your blessing on everyone watching today, and uh, you would continue to shape us according to your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. God bless.